For the first time on television, News 13 investigates the whole story behind a toxic Superfund site in South Asheville. The EPA's Inspector General has even launched a criminal investigation into the EPA's handling of the old CTS site that dozens of Buncombe County residents believe made them sick. News 13 has followed this story for more than a decade. And now, we're taking an in-depth look into contamination at the site that has recently been listed as one of the most highly prioritized Superfund sites in the country. This is News 13's special report, Buried Secrets. Thank you for joining us. I'm Darcel Grimes. And I'm Larry Blunt. The Environmental Protection Agency is now investigating itself to see if it did enough to protect the people living near this hazardous waste site. Two North Carolina lawmakers have called for a criminal investigation, and they now want EPA officials to face congressional hearings. News 13's Mike Mason has this special investigation. More than three decades have passed since the old CTS site here has been added to the list of Superfund sites. And since then, little has been done to clean it up. We've been looking into this issue for the past four months, digging for the truth, working to uncover what many are calling buried secrets. These are the faces of those living in the shadow of the old CTS plant. And I move here to live at peace. Some battling cancer and other terminal illnesses they say was caused by exposure to toxic chemicals. And our whole life has been destroyed. Like trichloroethylene, or TCE. I have a lot of problems. Others fear they'll suffer a similar fate down the road. Why are you not cleaning this up? CTS, now based in Elkhart, Indiana, manufactures electronic components at plants around the world. CTS did business in Asheville from 1959 to 1986 and used TCE to clean and degrease those components. In 1990, four years after CTS shut down its Asheville plant, the EPA hired a company to test the site for contamination. They found toxic chemicals in the soil and water, and to this day, they haven't been cleaned up. Those who live nearby say this problem has remained buried far too long. How do you keep going? It's hard. It's really hard sometimes. Dot and Larry Rice live right next door to the CTS site. Their family has owned this property since the 1950s. Larry was a highly decorated veteran. During his long career in the military, he and Dot lived near numerous military bases. When he finally retired, they settled into their South Asheville home. We had planned, you know, this to be our home and to leave it to our, our kids. And um, my husband uh, had been in Vietnam and he survived the Agent Orange. But Larry would soon face another battle with an enemy he never saw coming. <laughs> In April of 99, my husband had been diagnosed with a brain tumor. At the age of 61, Dot Rice now had a new full-time job <laughs> taking care of her sick husband. So he t retires in November, he gets sick in April. It wasn't long before Dot became sick herself. Mm -hmm. She was later diagnosed with skin cancer and two thyroid tumors. One of my tumors, uh, I couldn't speak for four months. The Rices thought their health problems may have been genetic. After all, Dot's father-in-law, Clifford Rice, lived on the property and died of esophageal cancer a few years before. But when Dot's 21-year-old granddaughter, Devin, was given a serious diagnosis in 1999, she knew it was more than just genetics. She had started having uh, blurred vision and was blacking out. And then they discovered a, a brain tumor on her too that year. To this day, Devin struggles to cope with problems associated with her brain tumor, which doctors have ruled inoperable. In 1990, the Rice family didn't know their well water was contaminated. But records show EPA officials did know and for some reason failed to notify residents until 1999. It was just unbelievable that, that EPA would do that. In 1990, the EPA Superfund Division hired the company NUS to test for toxic chemicals at the CTS site. This map indicates NUS also went to the Rice's property next door and tested the sediment in their spring. The same spring that flowed into the Rice's well 
and supplied the family with their drinking water. The tests were positive for the toxic chemical dichloroethene, or DCE. After testing, NUS issued this report stating, DCE and vinyl chloride are degradation products of TCE. Scientists we spoke with say the presence of DCE most always indicates there's also a source of TCE nearby. It breaks down into DCE, vinyl chloride, um, and it is a carcinogen. It is a, um, uh, so it is known to cause cancer. According to the EPA, both chemicals are linked to cancer and other serious health problems. Both NUS and the EPA's records show after finding DCE in the rice's stream, NUS did no additional testing for TCE on the rice property. They did, however, test for both DCE and TCE in two of the streams on the CTS site, and both chemicals were detected. The level of TCE in the water was 16 times higher than the state's regulated limit. When NUS gathered those samples in June of 1990, they never got the rice's permission to even test on their property. More importantly, both NUS and the EPA failed to notify the rices their spring water was contaminated with a chemical linked to cancer. They knew about it. How could they do that? That's what I keep asking. How could you do it? The rice's neighbors, Mac and Becky Robinson, had also been drinking well water that came from the rice's spring. Around that same time, they too were having serious health problems. My thyroid shut down. I have a lot of joint and ache pains all the time, the fibromyalgia. Becky's mother-in-law, Ethel, who lived next door, passed away suddenly in 2008. The Robinsons were shocked to learn cancer had spread throughout Ethel's pancreas, liver, and colon. She was healthy. She was healthy as an ox. At the time, Becky's daughter, Shannon, also began battling a series of health problems. During her childhood, Shannon had her gallbladder removed, her appendix burst, and her body was covered in cysts. At the age of 18, she became pregnant, and health records show she had even more problems. Finally, my son, he was born six weeks early. Um, I got preeclampsia and toxemia, and my liver had shut down. EPA reports state ingesting even small amounts of TCE over a long period may cause liver and kidney damage, impaired immune system, and impaired fetal development in pregnant women. Two years after her son was born, Shannon had another baby boy, also premature. Both boys were diagnosed with compromised immune systems. Becky herself has undergone more surgeries than most people have in a lifetime. 12 or 13, yeah, 12 or 13. Surgeries? Mm -hmm. And this was in, uh, within a um, seven year period. Then, by the age of 24, Shannon needed a total hysterectomy. Today, at the age of 37, Shannon still relies on potent painkillers. This is uh, my methadone. To cope with her medical issues. And I take it once a day. Shannon's lifelong dream of becoming a nurse had been shattered. She could have made something of herself. In 1990, the Rices and Robinsons knew nothing about the testing going on next door at the CTS site. They had no reason to believe their developing health problems could be related to their water. But that would soon change. And they have wells everywhere. Here's one. In 1990, the Rices' friend Dave Ogren was so concerned he called North Carolina's Division of Environment and Natural Resources, or NC Diener. Whoa. Something is not right. This report shows Ogren told state officials he suspected the rice's well water was contaminated by chemicals on the CTS site, and he wanted to know if that was causing their health problems. And I just made my call and figured it's all taken care of. Everything is going to be handled. But the state didn't contact the rices. Even so, the rice family felt something just wasn't right. And we continued to smell something really bad. It would be nearly a decade before the Rices or any other residents were told about any contamination. We had been drinking water that EPA knew had been tested, and they knew it nine years before we did. In 1980, CTS was required to submit this notification of hazardous waste activity to the EPA. In the report, CTS acknowledged generating and disposing of hazardous waste off-site. As a result, the EPA added the CTS property to its inventory of Superfund sites that year in 1980. 
Then in 1985, CTS submitted an assessment report, required by state law so officials could gauge any potential risk to the public. CTS reported the nearest residents lived 500 yards or 1,500 feet away from the plant, and they all use city water. Those two statements are factually incorrect. But state officials didn't question the information from CTS, and two weeks later, they sent this letter to the EPA Superfund Division. The state reiterated what CTS reported to them, claiming there are no known drinking wells in the area, and the site poses no threat to human health. They then ranked the site as a low priority. State and EPA officials accepted CTS's report without question. In 1990, five years after receiving the CTS report, the EPA hired a private company called NUS to thoroughly inspect the old CTS site to assess whether conditions had changed. NUS inspectors came to Asheville and soon found information that conflicted with the CTS report. After reviewing records from the Buncombe County Water Department, NUS found there were 714 homes within four miles of the CTS plant that relied on private wells for drinking water, despite what CTS had reported in 1985. But in 1990, NUS also overlooked something very important. While conducting a risk assessment for the EPA, NUS listed the closest private well as being 4,000 feet away from the CTS site, when in fact the Rice family lived right next door. Their well was only about 50 feet away. I just think EPA has just made mistakes from the very beginning. We contacted the EPA and a representative from NUS to find out what had happened, but they haven't provided an explanation. We know the Rices, along with many other nearby families, were living closer than 4,000 feet away from the CTS site. Mm -hmm. In 1990, many were using wells for their drinking water, but for some reason, NUS failed to include those families in their report, and as a result, any potential risk associated with their drinking water was also overlooked. We were using spring water. It seems like you could have knocked on some doors. <laughs> <laughs> For the past six years, high school Good. history teacher Tate McQueen Good. That's great. has made it his mission to uncover the truth. Yeah. He and his family live less than a mile from the CTS site. <laughs> He's the vice president of a community action group focused on getting the site cleaned up. <laughs> ah, wipe out. <laughs> this is a major contamination zone. In 2010, McQueen and 24 other families filed a civil lawsuit against CTS Corporation. In court documents, they claim CTS caused the contamination, which created a continuous nuisance. The plaintiffs claim the contamination has harmed both their health and property values. The suit demands CTS clean up the site immediately and compensate affected families. In September, CTS appealed the lawsuit to the U.S. Supreme Court. We tried to speak with CTS officials about the case, but they haven't returned our calls. In 1990, they went into this ditch area. McQueen um, filed the lawsuit in 2010 after learning NUS had tested the Rice's Springs in 1990 uh -huh. without their permission. Correct. Before that, the only thing the Rice's knew was that their well water had always tasted horrible. For nine years. But they didn't know the reason the water tasted bad was because it was full of contaminants. The Rices say they would have stopped using their well water immediately in 1990 if NUS or the EPA had simply warned them about the contamination. It was hard to believe that somebody that is supposed to be protecting the people would do that to a family. NUS completed the site inspection of CTS in 1991. Even though NUS found TCE and other toxic chemicals at the site, the EPA decided no further action was needed to clean it up. NUS's report stated the contamination could potentially affect the air as well as the ground and surface water. They determined the on-site exposure is not of concern because a chain link fence around the plant limits access to the facility. EPA officials agreed with the findings and issued their final report in 1991. That same day, the EPA archived CTS, essentially removing it from their list of Superfund sites. Nearby residents had no idea this had even happened. You, know, you, you don't expect people to, to do things like that. Meanwhile, Dot and Larry Rice felt their water just wasn't safe to drink. So during a drought in 1986, they shelled out $1,500 to connect their home to city water. But when the drought was over later on that year, 
they continued using well water. But the Rice's two sons who lived on the same property next door didn't have a choice. They relied exclusively on well water. But the two boys over there were still drinking the water. Then in 1999, tragic news. <laughs> Larry was diagnosed with a brain tumor. That same year, just a few months later, the Rices complained to state officials saying they felt their spring water was contaminated. <laughs> they uh, started doing some testing and, and they came up with the, the TCE. State inspectors found TCE in both the Rices spring and the Robinsons well water. That day in 1999 was the first time residents were told their water was contaminated. Even then, both the EPA and NUS failed to disclose the fact they knew about contamination nine years earlier, back in 1990. They would have let us die. Both families suspected TCE is what caused their health problems, but a local oncologist we spoke with says proving that is nearly impossible. So we really don't know a whole lot about the long-term exposure, uh, except the links to cancer. In 1999, the EPA reported finding extremely high levels of TCE in the Rice's spring, 21,000 parts per billion. That's 7,000 times the state's regulated limit of three parts per billion in water. In 1999, the EPA put the CTS site back on the Superfund list and quickly issued an emergency action memo stating immediate action must be taken. Officials provided both families with bottled water and soon after connected city water lines to the Robinsons' house and the two homes belonging to the Rice's sons. Ooh, EPA good. officials then delivered a harsh warning to both families. The water is very dangerous. You're not to drink it. You're not to bathe in it. You're not to wash clothes in it, wash dishes in it. It's very dangerous. In 2007, the EPA fenced off three acres of the Rice's property around their springs. Well, now that's where it all is. At the time, the Rices were away in Florida. Without even telling us they was going to do it, they did it. Dot worried things were getting very serious. She wondered how long her family's water had been contaminated and whether that caused their health problems. Well, I was angry and, and I was devastated. Clues to some of her questions began to surface that year at Asheville's PAC Library. In 2007, the EPA sent this binder of information to the library and it soon caught the attention of local chemist, Barry Duran. There's an absolute responsibility here to hold accountability. It was the EPA's administrative record for the CTS site. The law requires the EPA to make these reports available to the public near Superfund sites where contamination must be cleaned up because it poses a threat to people's health. Duran noticed the official record was incomplete, so he questioned Buncombe County's hazardous waste officials. Why were certain pages missing? And basically, uh, I really didn't get much of an answer. Duran then photographed each page of the report, cover to cover, a decision that would later prove well, crucial. It, it paid off because the uh, administrative record was removed. Just six weeks after arriving at the library in 2007, Duran says that record mysteriously disappeared. He found this troubling considering these documents are required by federal law. Duran felt he could be onto something big. So he and McQueen contacted the EPA's point person at the time, David Dorian. Anywhere the contamination is gone is relevant. Who admitted removing the records. And David Dorian uh, has said to me on two different occasions that he removed the administrative record because the librarians were concerned, according to him, that his files were taking up too much space. But the head librarian, Ann Wright, tells us that's not true. Dorian won't comment because of the EPA's ongoing criminal investigation. At this point, McQueen began to suspect the EPA was trying to hide something. We've been asking for certain documents for years, and we never got them. He reviewed Duran's photos of the EPA's administrative record. The report detailed NUS's testing back in 1990, but it stopped abruptly on page 16, in mid-sentence, right before revealing the test results and other pages were also missing. The references were missing and the summary was missing. So where's the rest of the story? That story began to unfold in 2010 after McQueen and Duran obtained additional records from the state's file on CTS. The state's copy of the 1990 testing report included many of the pages missing from the EPA's report, including those showing NUS took samples from the Rice's private property without their permission. 
The state's report showed how NUS sampled the sediment in the Rice's Spring in 1990 and found the toxic chemical DCE, which the EPA says is linked to cancer. Scientists say small traces of DCE indicate there's a source nearby with even higher levels of TCE. But according to the report, NUS didn't test for TCE on the Rice's property. I don't know why either TCE was not tested for or was not reported. As a scientist, that doesn't make any sense. No, it doesn't. Dr. Jeff Wilcox teaches environmental science and geography at UNC Asheville. He says it's highly unusual to not test for TCE when DCE has been detected. It doesn't make any sense to me uh, why you would test for DCE and not also test for TCE. And it doesn't make any sense once you detected DCE that you wouldn't go back and test for TCE if you hadn't already. We contacted both NUS and the EPA for an explanation, but they haven't responded. The NUS report also shows they canceled all four of the groundwater tests they had originally scheduled around the CTS site in 1990. Wilcox says those early tests could have shown whether chemicals had begun seeping into residents' drinking water. The EPA won't comment on this, and there's nothing in the report to explain why those tests were canceled. No. It wasn't until 2010 that Dot Rice finally learned the truth about the testing done on her property back in 1990 some two decades after the EPA knew about the contamination. We asked her, hey, did you, did you know that they, EPA sampled your property on June 26th at 9.30 in the morning in 1990? And she said, no, I did not know that. And it was uh, heartbreaking. It makes me mad because they knew way before my kids were even thought of that this was going on with the water. Residents living nearby were also upset the EPA didn't tell them about the contamination either. So why wouldn't you go knock on the door and say, what's your water source? It was hard to believe that somebody that is supposed to be protecting the people would do that to a family. People wanted answers, and so did we. After requesting interviews with EPA officials for months, we were finally allowed to speak with Samantha Urquhart Foster. EPA will make a final decision on the cleanup plan. She's the EPA's project manager assigned to the CTS Superfund site. We spoke with her from Atlanta via satellite. But first, officials made it clear we only had about 15 minutes and we couldn't ask any questions about what the EPA had done in the past. If you're talking about things that happened before my time period, which has been in the past two and a half years, I'm not prepared to answer those questions. Our investigation continues as we examine what CTS's role was in all of this. We'll introduce you to a man who was in charge of running the CTS plant in Asheville. How can you undo something? You can't. I wish we could, but you can't. Why, nearly three decades later, he has now decided to break his silence for the first time ever. Coming up next. Welcome back as News 13 investigates buried secrets. After doing business in South Asheville, CTS left behind a toxic Superfund site. And after 27 years, little has been done to clean things up. News 13 investigative reporter Mike Mason found the man in charge of running the plant until it closed in 1986. Tonight, for the first time ever, he discloses what led up to the contamination and what he feels could have been done to prevent it. Making sure that our water is safe, our air is safe, and making sure that people who were abused like this are compensated even at this late date. Tate McQueen and Barry Duran had questions about what CTS's role was in all of this. It's a human health issue. They also wanted to know why the EPA waited until 1999 to tell residents about any contamination, 13 years after CTS had already left town. Records show state officials first learned about the chemicals at CTS back in 1980. That's when the general manager for CTS's Asheville plant, Charles Beitner, applied for a hazardous waste permit. Yeah. That permit was required by the state to track the use and disposal of toxic chemicals at CTS. In 1980, CTS reported generating more than 100,000 pounds of toxic waste annually. They divided the waste into three categories, chemicals, sludge, and solvents. Beitner says CTS used TCE as a solvent to clean grease off electrical components. There are several cancers that have been linked to TCE in humans. In 1985, the EPA did its first assessment of CTS. They reviewed the state's file on CTS, which included information provided by the company. CTS had reported hazardous waste have never been disposed on site or released into the environment. 
The nearest residents were located 500 yards away, and there are no known drinking wells in the area. The EPA used CTS's information to rank the site and determine whether it posed any risk to the public. And the closer you have people to the source that could be a target, the greater emphasis they'll put on a site as possibly posing a risk. That's when state and EPA officials determined the CTS plant posed little risk and ranked it as a low priority. McQueen says this was misinformation that helped set the stage for what would later become a hazardous waste site. So if you diminish the risk by saying, well, no one lives near here, and plus they're all in city water, then on paper, well, then there's no big deal. And it was a big deal. It would later become a huge deal for the Rice and Robinson families. In 1999, the EPA announced their drinking water was contaminated with high levels of TCE. The two families hired an attorney and threatened to sue CTS, claiming the company contaminated their springs and well. Yes. And that's what caused their health problems. So what did you want to be done? A cleanup. We never asked for a lot of money and we never got a lot of money. In 2005, after six years of negotiations, the Rice and Robinson family signed a settlement agreement with CTS. They say their attorney felt there wasn't enough documented proof at that time to prove CTS caused the contamination, and they were advised to take a cash settlement. In the settlement, the families agreed to never sue CTS again, and CTS denied any liability. So they said you cannot scientifically prove that TC caused any of our problems. Medical experts say it is difficult to prove TCE at the plant is to blame, but the EPA's own research shows exposure to TCE does cause cancer and many other health problems. Two years later, in 2007, critical information about the CTS site was finally released to the public when the EPA sent the administrative record to the PAC library in Asheville. That record documented the EPA's testing for contamination at the CTS site back in 1990. It also detailed the EPA's 1999 test results when high levels of TCE were found at both the CTS site and the Rice's Springs. The administrative record also included the EPA's action memo from 2002 stating the levels of TCE will increase and contaminants will migrate away from the site if they weren't cleaned up immediately. They said that the site posed a risk to public health and that it was time critical. The Rice and Robinson families feel the information in the administrative record would have supported their case against CTS, especially since it indicated how EPA officials knew the contamination was migrating away from the CTS site and onto the Rice property since 1990. But the EPA didn't release that record until 2007, two years after the families had already settled with CTS. In 2009, public pressure prompted local leaders to question how contamination from the CTS site got so out of control. This is footage from a Buncombe County Commission meeting in April of 2009. Commissioners such as Bill Stanley publicly questioned state officials from NC Diener. Stanley demanded to know what they were doing to clean up the Superfund site. Are you going to make CTS clean up that mess out there? That is, this is absolute positive. Are you going to do it? Can you make them clean it up? All of the work that is being done is to make CTS clean up the property. Commissioner Stanley then told officials about a conversation he previously had with former CTS official Norman Lewis. Lewis was the company's hazardous waste coordinator and worked at the Asheville plant from 1959 to 1986. Norman passed away a couple of years ago. And, and they, they dumped it, because when this first came up, I asked, what you people do out there? They said, yeah, we did. But it wasn't illegal at the time, what, what they were saying, and it wasn't, evidently. But it is now, and they should be the ones to clean it up. They should be smart enough to know it was illegal then. That stuff ain't going to help the ground. Uh, our but laws we just need to stay on them, my friend, and get it done. Yes. Get it done. Our laws do not distinguish whether it was okay to dump it in the past or not. They have to clean it up. Later in the meeting, NC Diener's liaison to the EPA, James Bateson, spoke about the effects of TCE in the drinking water. Groundwater is another question. Uh, certainly the Rice family, those two households, were being exposed to trichloroethylene in their, in their spring box in those two families over a, a long period of time. And it's not a comfortable thing to talk about that. And was that definitively attributed to the CTS plan? Pretty clear. Yeah. In 2010, state and EPA officials met with residents about the contamination. 
A community activist, not affiliated with the CTS Action Group, videotaped the meeting as Bateson made a bold statement. The fact that CTS released these compounds in the environment is easy to prove. Last month, Bateson emailed us saying, state and EPA testing in 1999 proves TCE was released in the soil beneath the former CTS plant. We were unable to reach CTS officials for a comment. But CTS has stayed in touch with the EPA. In 2004, the EPA listed CTS and the site's current owner as potentially responsible parties. Mills Gap Road Associates currently owns the nine-acre gated portion of the site. They purchased the 54-acre property from CTS in 1987 and later sold off 45 acres to a company that developed the upscale subdivision Southside Village. Mills Gap denies having anything to do with chemicals while they own the property. As a result, they refused to sign the EPA's consent order accepting liability. Last year, CTS officials did sign it and agreed to pay for future testing and cleanup. The EPA is required to identify all companies that may be responsible for contamination before a site can be placed on the national priorities list. That list helps to expedite a cleanup. In 2012, the EPA finally added the CTS site to the list. Because we're on the national priority list, so why don't they... Make it a priority? Make it a priority. That's what it's supposed to be. However, there's no timeline as to when CTS will finish the cleanup. Some residents question why CTS is even allowed to clean up the same site they're accused of contaminating. They say that's like the fox guarding the hen house. EPA officials disagree. Their contractors are doing the work. EPA is doing oversight to make sure they're following all the regulations. This past July, the EPA issued this letter to Congressman Patrick McHenry. They state their research supports the EPA's determination that TCE has been released from the CTS facility. At this time, the EPA has no reason to believe that other sources are contributing to the release of TCE from this site. So now, 27 years after CTS moved out of Asheville, the EPA's lengthy investigation has officially determined TCE did come from the CTS site. Still, neither NC Diener nor the EPA have provided any evidence that CTS knowingly dumped TCE or even mishandled it. Since CTS officials in Indiana haven't returned our calls, we went straight to the man who ran the Asheville plant for answers. Oh yeah. Charles Beitner was CTS's general manager of the plant for 23 years. Now, at the age of 88, I don't know what I could do. From the front porch of his South Asheville home, Beitner broke his silence for the first time ever. Yeah, I can understand why they would find some in the soil. Beitner recalls CTS having its share of problems. For instance, workers were fiercely divided between those who joined the union and those who didn't. Beitner says that tension created a hostile work environment. With the situation we had with the union there, people aren't going to speak up. Beitner says even though the atmosphere was tense, there was one thing everyone agreed on. It's hazardous to be around that TCE if you breathe it. After CTS shut down in 1986, officials wanted to sell the property. But first, they had to hire a company to test the site for contamination. That's when they found high levels of TCE in the soil under the plant's plating room where TCE was primarily used. What Beitner says about this is very important. He claims workers kept TCE inside a concrete tank called the degreaser. Workers would heat up the degreaser from the bottom while keeping the top open. Heat caused the chemicals to vaporize, and those steamy vapors would clean off the electrical components workers had placed inside a basket above the chemicals in the degreasing tank. The, the degreaser sits in the concrete pit, if you want to call yeah. it that. Okay. So that's the area where the high concentration's at. Oh, okay. I guess there was no see, you, liner. You, yeah, that's what I'm saying. There should have been something under the concrete pit to prevent it from going into soil. After TC was found in the soil, Beitner says EPA officials interviewed him about it. He then called his boss, Marv Goebbels, at CTS's headquarters to let him know. Beitner claims they were both surprised to learn TCE was detected at such high levels. I reported to Marv Goebbels and he said, well, we'll, we'll, you don't have to worry about it, we'll take care of it, you know. Marvin Goebbels was alarmed. Oh yeah, yeah. and that's what he told me, I can't believe it. And I said, I don't, I, I can't believe it either. So but do you think CTS is at fault? <laughs> Inadvertently, not knowingly, that yeah, that something was going wrong. The only thing I wish is that the EPA would take care of the situation and get these people taken care of before they all die off. 
and CTS will be held accountable. School teacher Tate McQueen and chemist Barry Duran. Uh, when I first got involved in this, it was actually back in uh, March 13, 2007. Have That's spent when, years uh, researching the contamination at the CTS site and how the EPA has handled it. My first objective was to make sure my family's safe, so I didn't feel like I had a choice. I had to get involved. Go. McQueen says EPA go, 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 go. officials have refused to give him certain documents related to the site. In June, News 13 sent the EPA a Freedom of Information request for any and all EPA documents related to the CTS site. A few weeks later, they sent us these three CDs. These three CDs contain nearly 63,000 pages of documents. That's a lot of information. And this is what 63,000 pages looks like. While we've been asking for all these documents, you asked for it, and within you know 10 days, you've got 62,000 pages, 62,922 pages. Duran and McQueen helped us to locate certain reports. Some were scattered in between documents, some buried beneath layers of folders and files. Many we found have never been released to the public. We found the tip of the iceberg. Okay, that's what we've been working with. They delivered to you the iceberg. Now, now all you have to do is melt it. All you have to do is go through and read it. We found the original study plan from NUS's 1990 testing. It included a map and plans detailing each area NUS had originally planned to sample for the EPA in order to gauge whether the contamination was spreading. According to this map, NUS and EPA officials never intended to do any testing on the Rice property back in 1990. That map changes the way we look at the site, literally. Part of the newly released documents may explain why the EPA switched locations. In 1990, just two months before testing began, the state sent the EPA this complaint made by Dave Ogren. And I looked down the hill and I thought, oh, there's the problem. Reporting his suspicion that the CTS site was contaminating the Rice's drinking water. Then, one week before testing, the state sent that complaint directly to NUS, and once again, they also sent a copy to the EPA. We believe that they changed the sampling locations in a week's time because they had been notified by the state. Records show NUS moved one of their sample locations from the middle of the CTS site to the Rice's Springs, all without asking for the Rice's permission or publicly reporting the test results. I mean, it was just unbelievable that it could happen to, to us. Residents wonder if they'd be healthier today if the EPA had simply warned them about the contamination back in 1990. That could have saved us from drinking this water an additional nine years. It could have saved my grandchildren from being even affected by it at all. Throughout the years, the EPA has spent millions of tax dollars testing at the CTS site. $8,573,115.97. Meanwhile, officials won't disclose how much CTS is spent. We asked Foster why the EPA hasn't removed the contaminated soil at the site. And we feel like the contamination has migrated down to the groundwater level, so just excavating soil um, at this point isn't necessarily the best solution. And at this point, the EPA has no solution for treating the contaminated groundwater. In 2006, CTS did use a soil vapor extraction system, or SVE, to remove 6,000 pounds of chemicals, including TCE, from the soil. But state officials questioned how successful it was, and in 2010, it was canceled. For years, residents and lawmakers have demanded an immediate removal of the soil at the CTS site. They want to know why the EPA won't do that, if it would eliminate the toxins in the ground. Well, soil, soil, soil remediation itself, I mean, was, that's what the soil vapor extraction system was meant to do. Um, it's one, one of many different treatment technologies versus excavating. To this day, neither the EPA nor CTS has removed the contaminated soil from the site. We wanted to know why, but after reaching out to CTS officials and their attorneys numerous times, we got no response. To me, it's in CTS's best interest to just clean up the site. Forget about EPA for a moment. I don't know why CTS doesn't clean up the site. Even though EPA officials have said CTS is a potentially responsible party, residents assume the EPA didn't have enough evidence to force the company to clean things up. Or did they? CTS has always denied doing anything wrong. In 2002, CTS's attorney responded to the EPA's concerns, stating, CTS has no knowledge of any such spill, leak, release, or discharge of hazardous substances. And CTS further stated, the plant was maintained in good condition. But we uncovered documents that seemed to contradict that. 
In 1987, CTS was in the process of selling 45 acres of the land to the developer Mills Gap Road Associates. Mills Gap wanted to gauge the extent of contamination, so CTS hired the company Law Environmental to conduct the testing. When that testing was complete, a report was issued to CTS. Inspectors had found elevated levels of toxic chemicals, including TCE, in the soil under the plating room. They reported the suspected source of the volatile constituent contamination is from spills or leaks. In the plating room, inspectors also noted there's an area where acid spilled from the tank and emptied into the drainage spillway. The concrete has been dissolved in this area, exposing the underlying soil. The company recommended further testing to determine if groundwater contamination was a risk. We uncovered another document that makes similar claims. In 2003, this letter was sent to the EPA from a company called TRW, which sold the building to CTS in 1959. TRW says when they operated the plant, they used acid brick on the floor trenches to keep chemicals from eroding into the ground. TRW claims it is reasonable to conclude that the sections of trench that were installed using cement, not acid brick, were part of later modifications by CTS, and the concrete trenches eroded, exposing bare soil, allowing liquids to discharge directly to the soil and into the underlying groundwater. That is super important because the CTS has had a history of claiming that the site was clean. We wanted to know what CTS and the EPA had to say about these documents, but they refused to comment. When we come back, we do our own testing to see if the air and water is still contaminated today. What we found has already caught the EPA's attention when Buried Secrets returns. Welcome back to this News 13 special report, Buried Secrets. EPA officials are being investigated for possible criminal actions for the way they handled the CTS site. Investigative reporter Mike Mason tracked down top EPA officials who finally admitted something resident Dot Rice has been waiting to hear for more than 23 years. How are you doing, Mike? How are you? I'm doing good. How are you? Good, good. Franklin Hill is EPA's Region 4 Director of Superfund Sites. On August 21st, Hill and other top EPA officials drove from their headquarters in Atlanta to Congressman Mark Meadows' office in Hendersonville. They wanted to meet with Dot Rice to talk about further testing on her property. She saw this as a chance to finally get some answers. We kept, you know, trying to, to find out why, you know, that EPA had known the water was contaminated and didn't tell us, and they had no answer for us. Dot brought along an MP3 player to record the conversation. Dot told officials she would consider their proposals but only if they would first admit to the testing done at her springs back in 1990. I think they, that somebody needs to say, you know, I'm sorry. You know, we came on your property in 1990, made test. Mr. Hill, I, I know you know that they came on our property in 1990, made the test, and uh, it was 1,100 parts per DCE, and no one told me why. As far as an apology, um, I have no problem with apologizing for that fact that we did not notify you of what we found in the spring. Hey, Mike Mason, WLOS. How you doing, Mike? How are you? I'm doing good. How are you? Good, good. Can I ask when you? When the meeting was over, we had our own questions for uh, Franklin Hill. First of all, uh, I heard that you admitted that you tested on the Rice property back in 1990. I think the file does indicate that there was a sample that was taken on the Rice's property. And it was contaminated. Yes. We then asked why, why the Rices were never told about it. I think what happened there is, at least based on the information that's been provided to me, is that we had a field uh, contractor in the field who was in the field taking samples, unaware of where he was, and took a sample in the stream. Um, I don't think there was any, negligent, uh, any negligence on his part. But nobody told them about the testing in, nobody told them about the testing in 1990. We're going to have to go, I'm sorry can't answer that question? I mean, isn't that negligent? That's, that's a toxic chemical, sir. Mike, what I'll say to you is that there's been no negligence on anybody's part um, here in Buncombe County. On your Have a good day. We never got a chance to ask Hill other questions we had, like why were pages missing from the EPA's version of the 1990 inspection report? The state's copy clearly referenced a set of field logbook notes, 
Field inspectors take these notes to detail their testing hour by hour, and those notes could possibly explain why NUS moved the test to the Rice property. We believe um, may have uh, evidence that shows that they made a conscious decision to go onto the Rice property. For years, residents and lawmakers have requested the logbooks, but the EPA claims they're missing. When News 13 requested the logbooks in August, the EPA sent us this letter stating those records did exist at one time, but both NUS and the EPA's copies must have been misfiled or no longer exist. The EPA did, however, produce the field logbook notes from testing they did in 1999. The EPA hired NUS again. By this time, the company had changed its name to Tetratech, and the EPA was now referring to CTS as the Mills Gap site. The EPA's contractor maps from 1990 and 99 both show the spot where inspectors tested on the Rice's property, and both maps indicate there's a pipe or culvert leading from the CTS site to the area next to the Rice's springs. In the 1990 field logbook, inspectors referred to this pipe as a drainage system for CTS. That was stated on their worksheet that that's where it was, that drained onto our property. In that logbook, inspectors wrote, they collected the Rice's sediment sample at the drainage pipe outfall, which drains the Mills Gap site property, and the flow continues onto the Rice residence property as an unnamed stream. There is an oily sheen on the surface water with a slight odor. When NUS found DCE in the Rice's stream back in 1990, they reported it may be attributed to waste handling practices at CTS. One of the most important documents in all of this may be this emergency action memorandum from 2002. That's when EPA officials determined the contamination at CTS posed a threat to public health requiring immediate action. And this memo authorized the government to pay for the cleanup. They could do it right now. I mean, they could, they could go in right now and do that. The memo states the situation at the site will worsen if a removal action is delayed or not taken. The presence of contaminated soil beneath the building at the site poses a threat to the nearby population and environment. Unless removal actions are initiated and completed, the contaminants will continue to be a source of groundwater and surface water contamination. The EPA called for six months of testing, and then the soil at CTS would be treated or removed. That was 11 years ago. They promised they would clean it up, and they haven't. I would like to see a complete cleanup. The EPA knew if they failed to take immediate action, there would be consequences. Their memo states, based on the extremely high levels of TCE in the Rice's spring, it is not unreasonable to expect the TCE levels in the well water to increase over time. And they did. In 2007, Dot Rice paid a private company to test their springs, and they found TCE had risen to 293,000 parts per billion. That's over 97,000 times the state limit. And still, no cleanup. Oh, I was really curious as to why it wasn't being done, and all this time had gone by. It was right down in there. But EPA officials tell us they did comply with the action memo by installing that fence around the Rice's spring in 2007. The springs that are most contaminated were fenced off to prevent human exposure. So the, you know, any immediate threats of exposure have been addressed under the removal program. Explanations like these only angered residents more. They had grown tired of waiting and demanded action. What we're looking for is a complete cleanup. In October of 2007, EPA officials came to Asheville and began holding public meetings to talk with residents about the CTS site. They thought it would help defuse the tension. But now, 30 meetings later, many residents are more upset and less trusting of the EPA. And it's hard to, to, um, to find any faith at all that anything will ever be done. In 2012, the administrative record for CTS finally reappeared at the PAC library, five years after it went missing. The EPA replaced the binder with CDs, but once again, McQueen noticed a problem with one of the reports. And it was incomplete. It was missing over 160 pages. For decades, state and federal officials have tested for toxic chemicals in and around the CTS site. This past July, we came out to the Rice's property to test their springs for ourselves in the same area the EPA had tested back in 1990 and again in 99. Dr. Jeff Wilcox and one of his students came with us to make sure we followed the same protocol used by the EPA. 
Wilcox has tracked the contamination for years. You can totally see the groundwater just bubbling up right He has there. also worked with the EPA in the past and now incorporates the rice's contaminated property into his teaching curriculum at UNC Asheville. Uh, starting last summer, we started collecting samples from inside the spring area and have had samples ranging up to 14,800 parts per billion. That means the level of TCE was nearly 5,000 times the state limit of three parts per billion in water. The last time Wilcox tested the rice's spring was back in January. So we're going to sample the freshest sample we can we can get. This time he took a sample from the head of their spring, about 60 feet from the CTS site. I took another about 50 feet further downstream. Back at the lab, Wilcox used the EPA's approved method of testing and within 30 minutes, we had the results. So the first sample you collected is 735 parts per billion. That's 245 times the state's regulated limit. And you're gonna see these bubbles. But the sample Wilcox took was much higher. Uh, at the spring is 5,500 parts per billion. That's more than 1,800 times the state limit. And remember, we took these water samples 27 years after CTS shut down operations. We wondered if toxic vapors could also be detected in the air. In 2008, the EPA's air testing showed high amounts of TCE around the rice's property, 16 times the state's acceptable level. In 2009, NC Diener official James Bateson spoke about the issue of toxic vapors around the CTS site during a Buncombe County Commission meeting. We strategized a lot to try to catch a whiff up there, but it's difficult. But EPA officials were concerned about the vapor levels. They issued this memo in 2010 after their experts reviewed the 2008 test results. They determined the levels of TCE vapors in the air showed a need for future monitoring if the source is not removed or addressed. There's been no source removal or mitigation since that memo came out. Each time we went to the rice property, yeah. we could easily detect a heavy odor of chemicals. There it is. You what? smell that? Yeah. That's solvent. That's so we decided to conduct our own air test. It's on there tight. News 13 purchased the same test kit used by the EPA. Dr. Wilcox installed the canister along the rice's fence line in the same location the EPA tested back in 2008. There we go. Within a week, our results were in, and the level of TCE vapors was more than twice the amount the EPA had reported in 2008 in the same location. According to our test, the TCE in the air had risen to a level of 39 times higher than a state's acceptable limit. What the second test showed is that there is variability in the concentrations. We've been asking for years for the EPA or NC Diener or whomever to do additional air testing. All of the recommended protocols suggest when you're above the screening level that you do additional testing. When we told EPA officials about our test results, they were eager to get a copy, so we sent them one. They then sent us this email stating the higher levels of TCE could be related to higher rainfall this year. The email states in part, rain refills the aquifer which raises the level of the groundwater table. A rise in the groundwater table could result in more TCE and other chemicals flowing out of the ground and into the springs on the rice's property. TCE and other volatile chemicals evaporate from the springs and are transported into the nearby air. EPA officials say our testing reinforces their commitment to complete vapor intrusion studies for homes located near the rice's springs. Wilcox's research, he also studied TCE levels in the trees growing along the rice's property. And we've lost probably 20 trees around the, the spring area that have just died. By taking core samples from trees, Wilcox has been able to map out how far and in what direction TCE has been spreading through the years in the soil and water. Back in 1990, NUS testing showed TCE had already begun migrating away from the CTS site. Today, TCE continues to flow at high levels here at the Rice's Springs. Their spring is connected to Robinson Creek, which eventually joins up with Cane Creek. All of that water then empties out into the French Broad River. The EPA report from 1991 stated, the French Broad could be affected by the contamination at CTS, but EPA officials didn't take action to prevent it. Now, 22 years later, the EPA is still in the testing phase and admits it will be quite a while before there's any real cleanup at the old CTS site. It'll be several years. The remedial investigation phase process takes a couple of years to get through, and this is a complex site. We've got fractured bedrock. Um, it's, it's pretty complicated. The EPA knew how complicated it was more than a decade ago. 
In 2001, they hired Lockheed Martin to drill boring holes under the CTS plant. When they got down 34 feet, they reported finding TCE in the soil at the highest level recorded yet, 830,000 parts per billion. In 2000, the EPA had reported the water table was approximately 50 feet below the ground. So at that time, officials knew TCE was seeping further down into the soil. In 2001, it had reached a depth of 34 feet and only had 16 feet to go before TCE would enter the groundwater. The Lockheed study not only confirmed TCE still remained in the soil in shallow bedrock, but it also warned EPA officials that contaminants would move away from the site once they reached the water table. Now, 12 years after that ominous warning, EPA officials confirm TCE has now entered the groundwater. It's going to travel with the groundwater until the source is removed. But despite what scientists say, EPA officials have no plans to remove the soil at the CTS site. We feel like the contamination has migrated down to the groundwater level, so just excavating soil um, at this point isn't necessarily the best solution. Nearby residents felt helpless. If the EPA won't help, then who will? The fumes were just terrible. We went straight to lawmakers to see how they felt about the way EPA officials are handling the CTS site. Based on the evidence that I've seen today, it is very troubling. Troubling enough that Congressman Mark Meadows is talking about holding people accountable, even if it means possible jail time. News 13 continues this investigation into buried secrets when we return. Welcome back to this News 13 special report into buried secrets. The contamination from the CTS site greatly concerns many families living nearby. News 13 investigative reporter Mike Mason hosted a town hall meeting in July packed with residents. On July 8th, News 13 hosted a town hall meeting at the Skyland Fire Department. All those concerned with the contamination at the CTS site were invited to attend. More than 100 people packed the room. Can you raise your hands if you think that you may have been affected by any contamination regarding CTS? Just keep them up for a second, please. Okay, that's, that's quite a few people. Has anybody here had a relative who they think died because of being exposed to contamination regarding TCE? About 15 people? Although the Rice and Robinsons were the first families notified about the contamination in 1999, many more have since been affected. Some who weren't notified are now concerned their water was also contaminated. In the past year, CTS has paid to install water filtration systems at 96 homes, all located within one mile of the site. Buncombe County has connected dozens of other homes to city water lines, but there are more than 100 additional families still waiting to be connected and county taxpayers will end up footing that bill. Some residents are furious with how officials have handled the whole situation. Where are the politicians? This is a huge community with ramifications not only here, but for the French Broad River. They're not here. If they gave a rat's butt, they'd be here. Amen. Some living close to CTS are simply disgusted they still don't have access to clean water. When are they putting the municipal water lines in? It's been almost a year now since they promised us municipal water. Others who recently moved to the area moved are in disbelief. I moved here less than a year ago, and this is the first time I'm hearing of this CTS issue. I'm grossly sick right now hearing about this, all, this, all the human beings that are affected. These are families that have scars for life, people that have died. This is America. That's why I came to live here. Where is the justice? Overall, residents are hoping for one thing. We want the chemicals out more than anything else and the site cleaned up. According to Congressman Mark Meadows, that's a top priority. Meadows told us he questions how EPA officials handle the CTS site, especially when it comes to the Rice family. And the fact that they did test, they knew there was contamination and nobody told them, that's troubling. Meadows also reacted to new documents we uncovered. The information that I've seen to date is very troubling and would indicate that there was certainly improprieties in the way that it was done. One of those improprieties may include a report the EPA sent to News 13. We found it in those CDs, a copy of the EPA's inspection of CTS from 1990. You may remember how the EPA's version always had some pages missing. For the first time, the report appeared to be complete all 196 pages accounted for. 
but after careful review, we found the pages were hand-numbered. In fact, there were more than 20 duplicate pages inserted. It gives the appearance of being 196 pages. We found the EPA did not give us the full report, and the critical documents that had always been missing still were, including test results from the 1990 inspection. The EPA refuses to explain how this happened, saying it's all part of the criminal investigation. There is a story here that they don't want uncovered. Your discs that WLOS acquired from your FOIA uncovered. And remember the administrative record that disappeared from the PAC library in 2007? Federal law requires the EPA to make that record public so residents will know about the contamination and how it will be cleaned up. Since 1999, the EPA knew TCE was contaminating wells and at that time, federal law required the EPA to make that record public, but they didn't until 2007. News 13 questioned why EPA officials waited eight long years before releasing it. They then sent us this email, and for the first time admitted the administrative record should have been released for public view in October 1999. The potential for cover-up, the potential for evidence that wasn't shared. The EPA's administrative record could have provided that key evidence the Rices and Robinsons needed while negotiating with CTS. Instead, they agreed to settle in 2005 something they say they wouldn't have done if they had known the record would show up in the library two years later. McQueen feels there's enough evidence in those three CDs alone to support criminal charges against EPA officials. All of the uh, timeline now is clear what, what they did versus what they should have done, what they did when they realized what they should have done. All of these things are documented with the documents you got. Four days after our town hall meeting, the EPA sent this certified letter to News 13 stating they had inadvertently released sensitive information to us. They now claim those three CDs, which hold nearly 63,000 documents, contain personally identifiable information, along with confidential business information, which should be returned to the EPA. They also requested we destroy any copies we had made. I know why they want it back because the documents that you have serve as indictments uh, for their behavior. Uh, I believe that they are scared to the point of paralysis now. Meadows wants to know what, if anything, EPA officials have to hide. If it is a cover-up, we have to make sure that not only we hold them accountable, that, but that we send people to jail. Meadows plans to request congressional hearings, hoping that will force EPA officials to explain how a Superfund site turned into a landslide of controversy. And it is very, very concerning. Uh, that we would have this because uh, what we've got is an agency that didn't do their job. In 2011, the state's Department of Health and Human Services conducted a health assessment of people potentially affected by the contamination at the old CTS site. Within a one-mile radius of CTS, they found 49 cases of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and 10 people with liver or renal cancer. It may sound alarming, but officials determined that number was normal, considering the overall population. They have a very limited scope. Katie Hicks is assistant director of the nonprofit organization Clean Water for North Carolina. It's an environmental justice group that lobbies for safe water and public health issues. After reviewing the state's health assessment, Hicks found the study to be incomplete and misleading. For example, officials didn't speak directly with former CTS workers or local residents. The state only reviewed patient records at medical facilities between 1990 and 2005. Anyone who had moved out of the area was excluded. So you have people who have been drinking from wells in the uh, South Asheville community who just because they weren't contacted for the study or didn't know what was going on, it's assumed that, well, people probably didn't come into contact with it, so therefore there's not an exposure pathway. The Public Health Division addressed some concerns they received and put them in the appendix of the report. They admit they had limited data to work with. This past July, the state issued a follow-up assessment with similar results. Hicks also questioned several conclusions in that report, including one stating that chain link fence around the Rice's Springs will protect the public from exposure to TCE. So to claim that the public health threat is minimized just by putting up a fence is 
short-sighted and just not helpful to the residents who are pushing for cleanup. And the recent study didn't take into consideration the toxic vapors in the air. Breathing these vapors is, is one of the public health threats that could be the most urgent. In 2011, Dot Rice also did her own survey, going door to door, interviewing residents who lived within a quarter mile of CTS. She managed to compile a list of dozens who reported having serious illnesses. And we came up with 64 uh, cancers within, within a fourth of a mile area. These cancer registries that they're drawing the data from, this is exactly the kind of real on the ground data that they're not picking up on. At the end of the day, this story is about ordinary people brought together by one common belief, that toxic chemicals changed their lives forever. Whether they had worked at CTS, yeah, I lost years off my life, or had been drinking contaminated water, our whole life has been destroyed. They each have a story. With so much time passing by before anyone knew their drinking water was contaminated, many wonder, what if? What if CTS and the EPA had simply cleaned things up? How can you undo something? You can't. I wish we could, but you can't. What if the EPA told people their water was contaminated the minute they got those test results? Nobody told them about the testing in 1990. We're going to have to go, I'm sorry. And for those already diagnosed with cancer, what can be done for them? That's a difficult subject. I really don't know of specific treatment for the TCE exposure. Others wonder if they'll be affected later in life. Is it just a matter of time? That constant worrying. Will I be next? I lay awake at night and I think, where is it all going to end? We're just hoping that um, maybe with, with your story that you can reach somebody that feels for us and we'll see that somebody does something to get a cleanup. Last year, the EPA's Inspector General launched an investigation into allegations of fraud and other criminal acts involving how EPA officials handled the CTS site. Many feel congressional hearings are the only way to compel these officials to testify, and that's really the only way we'll find out what happened out here. We'll, of course, keep you updated. At the CTS site in South Asheville, I'm investigative reporter Mike Mason, News 13. We reached out to Congressman Patrick McHenry and Mark Meadows. Both support the criminal investigation into how the EPA handled the CTS site. Meadows also wants EPA officials to face congressional hearings. Senator Kay Hagan says she'll do whatever she can to protect the health of residents living near CTS, but she denied our request for an interview. Senator Richard Burr did not respond to calls or emails. State Representative Tim Moffitt has requested complete removal and replacement of the new soil at the CTS site. We tried contacting CTS officials and their attorneys numerous times, but they have not responded. Thank you for joining us for this News 13 investigation into buried secrets.